Hello, hello everybody. I'm just waiting for all of the folks to load up into our Zoom room. And then we'll get started. Okay, I think you're all here. So I just want to say greetings and welcome. I'm Jamie Asai Fitzgerald, Director of Poets and Writers, California Office and Readings and Workshops West program. Thank you so much for joining us today for our first California virtual town hall meeting of this fiscal year. I'm here with Ricardo Hernandez, Poets and Writers Readings and Workshops Program Coordinator, who will be providing technical support and helping to moderate the question and answer period and our discussion. Thank you so much, Ricardo. Appreciate all that you're gonna be doing to make things run smoothly. I'd also like to thank the California Arts Council for its support of these community building events. We are very grateful these convenings align with our mission to foster the professional development of poets and writers, to promote communication throughout the literary community, and to help make literature available to the widest possible public. This will be the first in a series of four town halls for Californians in which we bring to you a very special someone who will spark conversation about a topic relevant to writers and the writing community. As we are all keenly aware, we are living through some very challenging and historic times. And it's our hope that today's discussion will be a bright spot of inspiration to help get you through. So just a couple of Zoom etiquette tips. Please keep yourself muted um, while others are speaking but feel free to use the chat to comment, ask questions, make suggestions, and share relevant resources. Um, I also encourage folks to um, use the reactions if you wish, if you want to show your approval or excitement about something. And all of those controls are down at the bottom of your Zoom uh, screen, and you should be able to access that pretty easily. Um, just a quick note about the agenda, we're gonna have our guest speaker. There's gonna be some time for questions and answers, and that will hopefully lead into discussion. And then I will close by giving you some updates about our funding program for literary events in California. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Peter J. Harris, who is our very special someone. And as a fellow LA resident, I have had the pleasure of seeing Peter perform, talking with him at literary events, and I've, I've come to know him as unique as unique can be among humankind, as a free thinker, a doer, and a marvel. So I'm gonna read his bio. He's, he is a 2018 Los Angeles Cola Fellow in Literary Arts, a Fellow of the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities at the University of Southern California, author of the poetry collection Bless the Ashes, which won the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award, and the collection of essays The Black Man of Happiness in Pursuit of My Unalienable Right a book of personal essays, which I have a copy of here, which I highly recommend. This book won the 2015 American Book Award. In 2021, Flower Song Press will, publishes, will publish Harris's Safe Arms 20 Love and Erotic Poems with an Ooh Baby Baby Moan with Spanish translation by Francisco Letelier. Harris is founding director of the Black Man of Happiness Project, a creative, intellectual, and artistic exploration of Black men and joy. He writes the blog, Reeking Happiness, a joyful living journal at inspirationcrib.com. 
You can check out his 2018 TEDx Pasadena talk with Adenike A. Harris at Huntington Library, Healing versus Retaliation, Surviving Trauma and Sexual Abuse, described and celebrated 15 years of working with his daughter after convicting and jailing her predator ex-stepfather. Harris and his daughter are also contributors to Love with Accountability, digging up the roots of child sexual abuse. Since 1992, Harris has been a member of the Anansi Writers Workshop at the World Stage in Los Angeles's Lermert Park. And I hope you all had a chance to check out his collaborative video poem song again on the Music Center website, which I shared in, in one of the meeting emails. So I'd like to welcome Peter J. Harris. Whoa, we, that was beautiful, thank you. All right. And I'm glad we could, um, we could have uh, displayed uh, Jamie uh, and Ricardo while you were uh, sharing all that information. That photograph of uh, Kwame Ture was called Stokely Carmichael back then. But um, let me just tell you a quick thing about that photo. So I call it front porch. It's part of our see you emanating a sense of joy uh, social media campaign. And those frames are by my friend Julie Ray creative and that emanating a sense of joy tagline comes from the great work by a young research librarian. Her name is Helen Kate. I want to start with that photo because with this theme, uh, happiness as, a, as an enzyme, as a catalyst or whichever order you want to put that in. I, I really feel like it's important to, to zero in on that. Uh, those those things, happiness, uh, joy, catalyst, enzyme, um, during life and death, human rights work. So if anybody knows about Stokely Carmichael in terms of his public view, it's gen generally always the black power, powerful eyes on the prize gaze. Um, but when I saw this photograph um, of Mr. Carmichael with this gentleman, we don't know his name. I do know the photographer. It's a man named Douglas Gilbert. This photograph is part of a series that were taken in Lowndes County, Alabama in 1965. And, 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 and during that time, during a, a student nonviolent coordinating committee uh, voting, voting rights um, campaign, this photo was taken. And I look at that photo and I just grin because I know how dangerous it was at that time. But I see this young man, this firebrand, and I see this elder probably hosting uh, Mr. Carmichael because certainly there were no Motel 6s, et cetera, back in, in the day and certainly not for black folks in the South. In this photo, transformational history pulses within what I call dynamic stillness on a rural front porch. So here's this urban youngin inflamed with his mission to serve, sitting and connecting, literally holding hands with a big brother. And there are no guns, no weapons on display, although violence was actually a living presence threatening their work to animate democracy for the majority of Lowndes County's citizens. And that, was, that majority was majority black. So I feel like this campaign photo simultaneously captures a breathtaking moment in the lives of two real folks and reflects a moment where we get a glimpse into their interior dimensions, into their humanity and their wholeness. Of course, it was dangerous. I'm making, I'm making the case that even in the midst of the threats to their lives, these men had found a way 
and everybody I know, and I know a few people who actually worked with Mr. Carmichael, who uh, they always talked about his sense of humor, his quick wit, his ability to bring energy into the room. Um, I'd like to read a little bit from the book real quick. From now on, I'm making happiness the key enzyme, the untapped catalyst, the missing ingredient to all of my individual, organizational, and community social justice work targeted at, and you can choose one here, the black man in caps, men and boys of color, BIPOC, that's a new acronym I'm, I'm hearing, at-risk youth. So I say with all due respect to, to religion, to the greatness of the struggle, with much respect to valuable social service of every kind, getting beyond our pursuit of happiness to actually claiming happiness is the necessary 21st century uh, mission, the 21st century mission to refuel ourselves, to tap to tap the cultural creativity bequeathed to us by the African-American odyssey and to tap our own unique personal endowments. During a very dangerous time, um, one of the things that's inspiring to me is that the leaders of the Black Lives Movement, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, of other movements, they are actually certainly doing the resistance work, putting their bodies on the line. At the same time, they are sensing and knowing that we must look ahead, look more broadly, look more dimensionally. And so all of this larger discussion about how do we democratically allocate public funds in order to assure and contribute to community safety. Do we really need billions of dollars going to a militarized police force versus a sliver of that? Other people obviously are for abolition. We'll discuss it. That's the importance of this moment. Or should we use that money in a, a more broadly uh, uh, defined way about safety, public safety, public service, public protection? Um, the black man of happiness concept, the, I've written poems about this theme, I'm, you know, a play, we've done videos, you can see the videos where, on the Black Man of Happiness Project website where we're interviewing men of all different complexions and shapes and sizes and orientations. The Happiness Project for me sort of casts like a counter spell, my individual magic and yearns to honor my cultural community's legacy of insistent grown folk work. That's what elders when I grew up would call it. If you weren't grown yet, they might say, you ain't grown, you can't, <laughs> you trying to be grown too fast. However, now that I am grown, I absolutely embrace that this work of finding joy and happiness as a motivating, regenerating catalyst and or enzyme, it's absolutely grown folk work to me. At our cultural core, that work values our unalienable humanity within a dehumanizing crucible that has been backed up by hypocrisy and weaponry, laws and customs in order to define our role very simply. Make somebody else happy and then die. I think that the important message that I want to close with and see if we can generate any conversation is that the work that I stand for, the work that I'm doing is about happiness. It is not about becoming or being happy-go-lucky. 
Those are radically different things for me. So quickly, happy-go-lucky is protocol. It is trying to be comfortable or make someone comfortable. At its worst, it's like a minstrel show to me, frankly. Happiness, on the other hand, is the mesmerizing, unique, individual expression and experience of living in your life. So for me, I was motivated to use as one simple question for the, ha the Happiness Project. What is a happy black man? I like to pause so you can vibe on it. I don't have an answer. So what do I do? I ask people. This, the, the book uh, that uh, Jamie was kind enough to mention, uh, The Black Man of Happiness, is my uh, 15, 20 so chapters of exploring my answer to that question. When we turned the camera on to the men in 2010, a full decade ago, and we asked them, what is a happy black man? What makes you happy? We got a radical range of wonderful answers. I encourage you to go look at these men and just vibe with them and let them answer the question. And if you are African-American male or a man of African descent and you're answer, asking that question, look in the mirror and answer it. And whatever answer you give is a valuable, val valid answer. Because if you don't have individuality in this moment, what you end up with is a type and so as a result even a former president can stand at john lewis's funeral and typecast kwame ture uh, stokely carmichael who by all accounts absolutely was committed to serving the people in that old 60s way who and there are other photos that you can see of him in Lowndes County, riding a donkey, for example, holding a baby, smiling as he's trying to get a person to think about um, registering to vote. So even a president can stand at a funeral of another SNCC uh, member, John Lewis, and sort of typecast Stokely as this taciturn uh, firebrand who, you know, did not really want to be uh, uh, to work with America. If you look, if you read Kwame's uh, autobiography, you see how much he revered Dr. King, but not for the general generic, I have a dream energy, but for his integrity, for being right there with young people like Carmichael and others and saying, I'm open to change. So how about we stop there? I'm open to change my mind, if somebody can inspire me during this Q&A or this conversation or this critique. But those are some of the thoughts that I wanna share uh, in our short moments today. So I'm, I'm real grateful to, to Jamie and Ricardo and Poets and Writers. And uh, I, I look forward to whatever we discuss as we move through this next, uh, this next phase of the, of, the Zoom, of the Zoom experience here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Peter. So now um, we can open things up uh, and I encourage you to ask your questions in the chat. And also, um, if you'd like to use the raise hand function in the participant area, there is that capability here. We'll look for your blue hands to appear there. Um, if you have any questions. And um, Ricardo and I will help moderate. So let them fly. Do we have any questions? Yes, uh, Louise Rodriguez has a question. Louise, I'm going to float over to you. Um, so, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. So Peter, he's one of my favorite poets. We're old friends. Everybody knows our story. Um, I have to apologize, Peter, because I have to actually leave at five. I have a reading at five thirty. I zoom 
virtual reading I got to prepare for, but I wanted to at least honor that you're being honored here in this uh, event by people hearing what you have to say. Uh, the importance of that legacy that you talked about, I was actually in Lowndes County, Alabama, believe it or not. Um, people don't know that the original Black Panther concert was from there. And um, there's a lot of history that's very important to point out. So I appreciate you going back to that because I think we're in a time where history is being made. We're making history now. And so my question would be, how do you see, again, in that, the way you're trying to describe happiness, which I think is very powerful, but you're also trying to say, is there one way to say it? No. Uh, but how would you describe what would happiness be now in the middle of the conflicts that we're in now, which I think are very important? And how do you see happiness for either individuals or even as our society goes forward uh, happening, especially for um, black and brown people, but of course, you know, in, in anybody that's trying to be into the future as we're, we're born, we're birthing a new world. So I don't know, that would be my question. Again, my apologies, I have to leave early, but that's my question for now. Well, I, I, I think that the, the real question is, um, besides what, in addition to what you're asking is, is do we really value the citizenry of the country? Uh, do we really value our humanity? Because if you really, really look at some of the, uh, certainly this top-down uh, situation we're in, in with, with the, um, you know, with, with Trump and his crew, uh, his posse, um, his gang, um, the fundamental thing is that they have, th their whole existence is based on dehumanization. Uh, uh, what the academics call othering. Um, so, I mean, I'm absolutely an ally of uh, anybody fighting against this. So I think one, um, I say, my answer is I wanna humanize and make sure at all moments, I humanize the people struggling for something. Certainly against is absolutely necessary right now. If you ain't struggling against the kind of madness, social madness that has been unleashed, uh, and, and, and we know it's a, a, a spike that has, uh, this is a modern spike of a, of a line, a timeline of, of death dealing uh, since the beginning of the country. So uh, there's no naivete uh, in this response. Um, but this is an absolutely virtuoso moment because it's, we're seeing it. Uh, um, so one, I say that first answer is I humanize everybody, even my enemy. Um, I too, you know, so two, uh, I don't really honestly know, Luis, or, or, or to, to my colleagues out there, you know, I think that the, the answers come from the friction of doing things. Um, uh, for me, uh, having worked with young people, the work that I needed to do in the classroom is in its own sense t the same as I have to do on the streets because the people have to come across the streets. Lots, lots of times, as you know nowadays, crossing uh, 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 gang territories, etc. And Luis, I know you know that better than me, but the point I'm trying to make, I think, for the purposes of this afternoon, is ha happiness has to be a part of the toolkit. In other words, what are we trying to win for um, as opposed to what are we fighting against, which is the guiding thing? So if you win, what do you really want? So is it, is it just defunding? How do you implement billions of dollars? That's one of the things that I find interesting about and intriguing about this critique of how public money is spent. Certainly, there's been long discussions over the years about why does the security state receive all this money on the federal budget? But that has been pro, uh, paralleled across local jurisdictions for years. So I hope that contributes to an answer. It's something I'll keep grappling with and be open to learning uh, richer answers from other folks as well. 
Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I see Joanne Anglin raised. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, I'm probably not the only one on this site who works with people in prisons. So for about eight years, I've done uh, poetry, teaching poetry writing at New Folsom. Um, so this is very, very intriguing to me because my students, uh, some will maybe eventually get paroled, some have no expectation of that ever happening. So how can I bring and share with them the idea of a potential for happiness in such a limited situation? Yes, that is a major deal. I, I know personally, um, uh, I would go into prisons, I'd feel the same thing. Um, and Luis and them and you and other folks, have chosen to continue to do that work. Mm -hmm. I made a choice about 12, 15 years ago. I would only work with folks before they go in and when they come out to keep them from going back in. So one, that's just a personal testimony. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I mean, I, I, again, I'm not trying to be glib here, um, but I do think that self-reflection, self-awareness, uh, constant self-study, um, listen, uh, that they have to be parts of the conversation with whomever we're talking to and in whatever circumstance. I mean, I, I'm thinking back quickly. I won't, uh, again, I, I'm not trying to be glib here, but when I look at the picture of Mr. Carmichael sitting with the gentleman on the porch, you know, as I read about Lowndes County, you know, I think the, the total population at, in those days was like 15,000. And 13 or so, 12 to 13,000 of those folks were black. And only one or two people were literally registered to vote before SNCC joins. Certainly not, so there's, a, there's an element of that place being a prison because that wasn't because mm -hmm. people weren't interested in the politics, that wasn't become because people didn't understand the economic framework of the sharecropping world, et cetera, the legacy of slavery. And they weren't waiting for Stokely and them. They just wound up, in my way of uh, interpreting the experience, seeing SNCC and that work as a way to catalyze a new courage, a, a more persistent courage or to become those SNCC guys and gals were, were, were enzymes. And in a way, that's what I would say in part to what you just asked. What's the point of going into the prisons if you yourself are going to bring in a, a, a sort of fate, uh, a fatalist uh, type approach? In other words, you go in there because you really believe you're gonna do something on general principle. So if happiness can become one of your doorways into your way of approaching the conversations in those writing workshops, uh, in those theater workshops, in the gardening workshops, in my opinion, what you're really doing is one, looking the men, looking the women in, the, in their eyes and say, you are a human being. Do not let this system take that from you first. I don't know the circumstances, there are other more ideologically driven folks who might say that all of those folks are p political prisoners on general principle because of the racism and white supremacy. I don't tend to share that anymore as an old head, but I would say that when you enter those doors and you hear those gates clang and you look at those men and women, those boys or girls, if, according to where you are, juveniles, et cetera, you, you, you honestly and obviously didn't go in there naive and from the jump, which means that now you're looking at all times for new tools to continue to, one, give to your, your colleagues who, ha who are, incar are incarcerated, but also you are trying to cultivate and excavate out of them their uniqueness as they look at the future, as they look at what their reality is, the dangers that they face, et cetera. And you ask yourself to ask them, 
how do you want to solve this problem? How do you want to get out of here first off? And then how do you want to be part of the, the, the societal pressures and reframing that are right outside these gates saying mm -hmm. one, everything from abolition of prisons to reform, to debates with the guards, unions, et cetera, et cetera. Those are some of the things I would say, uh, I would encourage you to, 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 to sort of infuse into the work you're already doing. I have to assume, and I do assume, that you're only in there because you already peaked the game and you have a commitment to serve, but you have a right, one, to be happy yourself. So you may be reaching mm -hmm. Uh, deeper and have to really figure out whether it's, it's time for some new work. That's what I did when I chose to stop going mm -hmm. in the system mm -hmm. and do work with young people before they got in to try to veer off and peep, mm -hmm. uh, peep options for them. And if they come out to keep them from sliding back in, uh, in a recid recidivism type of vibration. I hope that contributes to the answer. Yeah, I, I, um, like when you say about cultivating and excavating what they have in them. That's, that's a really good um, metaphorical approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Jenny Lynn, or I believe you've had your hand raised. Oh, I'm unmuting you. Oh my, hi. 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 Oh my gosh, I haven't seen you in a hundred years. How you doing? You're still muted? Oh. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? I yes. unmuted. Yes, you're yes, good. You oh, great. Um, for me, happiness is a very abstract concept because everyone has their own individual definition of happiness. And I think um, it's problematic because everyone's um, definition of happiness is in collision right now, I see in this historical moment. It's happiness is in collision with other happinesses because you have the status quo, MAGA, boys, white supremacists, their concept of happiness may be keep the th things the way they were we want to keep the good old days the way they were, and we don't want any change. And you look at Black Lives Matter movement, it's all about, we want equity, we want racial justice, we want the playing field leveled, we want our rights, we want to be on par with you. So I think happiness has to be looked uh, at in a broader way rather than as an individual concept. How does my personal happiness um, impact on the collective consciousness and the collective well-being of all people. And until you can arrive on a collective uh, give and take uh, definition of happiness, I think we're always going to be at odds and opposition and collision with each other. So to kind of maybe, um, reduce it to more tangible situations and issues instead of, you know, an abstract happiness is for me, a material object for other people, maybe inner peace, peace of mind, um, a world uh, free of um, carbon, you know, toxins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a never ending um, conundrum. As you say, it's a conundrum and one, I think worthy of all of us contemplating and maybe addressing personally as well as collectively. So thank you very much for bringing it up. Well, you gave me chills, Jenny. And you know, this is exciting to me because, so for me, uh, that's why I say when Louise asked me the question, one, uh, this moment is a spike on a timeline what, what also is exciting to me is that within that timeline of danger and death and assault and settler, colonial and everything, there was always resistance. I think if my, there's probably some physicists on the line. 
this whole idea of equal and opposite reactions. Well, so one, appreciate it. But, and that, but, and just as I learned from you years ago uh, about uh, the poetry on Angel Island, uh, you know, just as I learned from other people about in the midst of the worst, there is this love uh, uh, for the all, the, the whole, the, 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 the need for democratic, uh, you, uh, uh, literally how you spend the public's money, everything. So what I'd like to also throw in here, Jenny, is um, when I say happiness versus happy-go-lucky, so for me, happy-go-lucky sort of is a generic term to encapsulate what you just said. So the MAGA energy, all of that, I, it's, it's mine. We won. I stole it. You can't get it back. Uh, that's what all that Trump mess represents for me. Uh, because I don't come out of that tradition. I come out of the tradition where the happiness that I'm talking about it is both individual uh, and it's collective and communal and it's ethical. It's not simply, I'm not gonna wear a mask cause I'm a white man and I don't, I, I still gotta go click through and get my, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, what is it? What's the big box store? You know, go to my big box store and get everything I want. It's none of that. That's not happiness. I mean, uh, not to me, and, and certainly from my own historical readings, uh, that is simply uh, the kind of continuation, again, another spike uh, of a, 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 a self-privileging, a, a, uh, a denial, a deep political denial. In fact, I actually don't even call it white supremacy. I call it whitelessness. It's a kind of denial where you literally think that a skin color, random biology, is endowed with some unique, uh, amazing quality. Um, so I know uh, much of, of, of Luis, and you know, when Luis, in, in his book, I remember this, this, this is one of my favorite anecdotes from Always Run. He's a young man, he's sitting with his, one of his mentors, they're in a little office. There's a globe on the table. The mentor says, bro, look at the globe and point out your hood, point out your neighborhood. And of course he couldn't find it. Um, and that began the process of opening his consciousness to realizing if you, you, you can fight all you want over a color or uh, over the name of a block or what have you, but you might be killing yourself over absolutely nothing. So I'm, I'm absolutely saying, I hear you, Jenny, uh, because w that's part, uh, uh, part of why I start my book out with the, uh, the European Declaration of Independence uh, by Jefferson, where I actually signify within the text of the uh, Declaration of Independence the very next text in the book is an ad by Jefferson chasing down a runaway enslaved man named Sandy, who was a mulatto, supposedly, that's that term. Um, and I want to make sure everybody on this call knows that I am absolutely fighting for the most ethical definitions of people's joy for the most people that in a society and not about some sort of namaste whispered, oh, we're all just fine. Uh, it, this is work that I'm talking about. I hope ah. that contributes to an answer. Yeah, good. That. Thank you Great. so much. Um, Thank you, Jenny. I have uh, Hazel Clayton Harrison, who has been her hand raised. Uh, oh. Hi, Hazel, I'm trying to find your window. There you mm -hmm. go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. 
Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, Peter. Um, we live in the same hood, so uh, and we've been on different uh, panels together. But um, as I was listening, first of all, I think this is a very important subject. And I happen to have my grandson here, who is 21 years old. Nice. And, you know, young blood. So as you were talking, I asked him, I, I invited him in to listen to your, your um, presentation. And I asked him, I said, do you know any happy black men? And I was very surprised to hear him say no. Mm. And also a little bit distressed. And so I want to have him ask the question about, because I asked him, I said, well, what is a happy black man and why? And so I want to have him, if you don't mind. No, uh, I love it. Yeah. His name is Everett. Um, greetings. Um, greetings, Everett. How are you? Good, good. Um, so to piggyback off of your response, uh, she asked me, do I know what a happy black man is or do I know of any? And I said, no. And, um, the reason I said no is because, you know, within this current time right now, It's always stressful, um, you know, with the recent killings of many black men and women. We can't exclude them either. Um, it's just always something, and I also said that along with it's always something is that we're constantly being judged and we're constantly, you know, have to be the next step above everybody. You know, me growing up saying that I had to work twice, maybe even three times harder um, as the next man, just to get in the same position as people who aren't minorities. Um, you know, there's always somebody commenting on how we look, what we say, quote Ebonics, you know, versus proper English. Um, we're always judged on ability versus intellect. We're never always, the first question I usually ask when, you know, I'm at work or whatever, you know, somebody wants to ask me, oh, what sports do you play? Instead of what are you majoring in? what's your interest is. It's always with sports, with position. Oh, okay, that's nice. And then, you know, up with their day. Um, and just a matter of things too, like even in the workplace sometimes, you know, I don't take it personally, but um, I just feel like there's always an intimidation factor Towards my other coworkers as well, interacting with me sometimes. And I don't come off as a threat. I don't come off, you know, nothing like that. Um, but it's just always judgment coming everywhere, and it's always opinions before we actually get to another person and be like, oh, yeah, you know it's always the intimidation factor that um, just kind of pushes people away and makes assumptions and such of the sort. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're, you're, you're really, really quilting together um, a ton of um, uh, Stuff that on one side feels like a, 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 an amorphous or miasma or ecosphere. It, it's just like it saturates our body and our minds and our spirit, and it becomes so stressful, such a burden, such a burden. You can't even just be a human being. Um, I think that that's critical to name first and foremost. I think that 
there, because I say, and I said earlier, and I will, this is, this really means something to me. I'm not a glib person about these matters. We live in an ugly, dim, dim, demoralizing, dangerous, both spiked moment, but also we have been surrounded. And so for me, what I do very often is I look back to, um, you know, uh, I'm from, uh, born and raised in DC in the 50s and 60s, 70s. So one, for my own personal uh, strength, uh, empowerment and strength, I do look back to that sort of brilliant golden moment of in and out exchange between a working class community that also, because um, we were at the latter ends of like overt segregation in and around DC, uh, just before folks moved out to Maryland and Virginia, mostly Maryland, you know, I lived around all kinds of classes of folks. I knew government employees from the post office out to labs, probably working, uh, uh, you know, for stuff I'm not even supportive of, but I knew actual black male physicists. Yeah, you know what I mean? People who, at least three I know from instant memory. So I look back first for me, I do value the simple fact that black men, uh, in my experience, have ranged from criminals to uh, and geniuses at it all the way out across to people who stood for all kinds of powerful political messages. Then when I do my homework, I also am a graduate of Howard University, and I got turned out by people who were literally the first generation of journalists who moved from the African-American press into Newsweek and Time and the Washington Post. I mean, like literally the first person to go into those gigs, but who also brought their consciousness in to those offices, who also brought their histories in to those offices. And then when they became teachers and professors at Howard, they looked us in the eye and they said, you can never be a journalist without, if you, and you can never be an innocent when you think about becoming a reporter or editor or a journalist. You have to really read. In fact, my most profoundly influential professors to tell me, don't even study journalism, study history, study sociology, study arts, all of that. He was right, I did major in journalism, but you know what I mean, I realized in hindsight, ah, oh, man, that's what I should have been really doing. Because what he was saying is, read all of this, understand all of this, so that you can make links and associations and connections. Something I really love to do as a poet, first and foremost. But now I get it. You don't want to... So I think what Jenny... Jenny, I, I don't want to misquote you, so feel free to clean me up if I get this wrong. But one of the ways I'm inferring something you said was, if we're dealing with the stress of being an African-American male uh, as just a, in, an individual walking down the street with no connection to community, with no connection to history, then that is a danger and you will not win. You will be uh, uh, in the target of everybody from the MAGA world to a blood or a crip in his or her worst uh, frame, of, frame of references. But if you are an individual who are, is a member of the circle, so to speak, um, I, I did, uh, Jamie asked me earlier, do I still work with, a, I used to work with an Afro-Brazilian dance company. And I love dance. And one of the most amazing moments was seeing everybody circled up as a community of dancers, especially at a party or after show or something. And then when the music hit somebody, the individual would go into the circle um, and dance their asses off. But they could only dance as long as they were ecstatically creative and were ecstatically contributing to something beautiful that lifted up the full circle. If they kept going beyond that, then they were, you know, about individualism and not being individual virtuosi, virtuosos. And then they, were, they would step back into the circle. 
And then their powerful virtuoso performance would then be picked up by another dancer. And all this was done almost like magic, it seemed to me. They certainly weren't saying, I'm next. Uh, let me type in my Zoom hand raise. They just were moved by the spirit and they moved in. So I am not downplaying by using this metaphor. In fact, that circle is an ancient art form um, that allows for democratic uh, execution of our genius is the way I look at it. Uh, but so I think that it's important if you're sitting in there, now I'm back to the young man. Uh, sorry, I forget your name, buddy. You're sitting in there with your grandmother. I think it behooves you to begin even the simplest in the simplest way. Grandma, who were the dudes in our family who I can look up to, who I can have a conversation with? Who were the cats in our family who stood for something, who stood on something? Who are the men who have passed on, who I need to know about? Who are the dudes who are living with whom I have to do? If it's, if it's a dad, if it's an uncle, if it's a teacher, then spread it on out. Who, what dudes helped you become the poet laureate of Altadena? You know, what dudes do you look to as credible human beings in the biggest sense of that definition? So there's so much more to talk about these things. I'm, I'm, I'm so sad that you can honestly answer that question that you don't know a brother who's happy. I'm so sad. And if that includes you, I'm going to say dap to you. Let's change that. We're going to work on that, brother, together if I got to be a part of it. Because as you're looking at a dude who from his youth in his early 20s on to just yesterday, I was on the phone with a, my big brother who's in his 70s. This is a chosen family brother, not my biological brother. I have been imprinted by such marvelous men over the years. Doesn't mean I haven't been imprinted by sisters. Of course I have. But we're talking about the theme of happiness as a catalyst, as an enzyme, and through the lens of the Black Man of Happiness Project. So it's not either or. And I will reemphasize that as we do however, for however long we stay on this call. It's not either or. Either I'm a happy individual random dude or I'm unhappy because of one thing or another. No, it's all in all. It's I'm a good human individual with gifts to give to the circle uh, and I want to be a part of the circle. And I want that circle to be valued and protected. I think that's what I hear in a very deep resonant way uh, when I hear Patrice and them talk, and I, I watch uh, the powerful people standing for, as I say, everything from stop killing us to let's defund your ass and reuse that funding because it's our money. It's not your money. It's our funds. It's our money. And, I, we're, and we're gonna change the society because this is where we live. Okay. so. I get hyped and then maybe I veer a bit, bit. but so uh, that's the one way I want to answer my brother's question or thoughts. Thank you so much. I'm going to interject um, because we are close to our end time. Amazingly. See, I trick um, guest presenters. I tell them they only need to speak for 10 minutes, but then they end up speaking for the entire <laughs> hour. I'm just kidding. Um, we can go maybe a few minutes longer than 5.30 if you would like, if you're willing to I'm stay. Game. Okay. I'm, I'm happy um, that anybody's interested minutes. in this. Yeah, yeah well, however long um, y'all wanna go, I'm here. And we'll have time to take one more question um, because I think some people have had their hands up for a while. So let's do one more question. Or maybe you can let four or five questions get thrown up like confetti and then we can answer them all like that so everybody can sort of get a sense that they're being okay. heard. Okay, that's a great idea. Let's do confetti questions. Um, Ricardo, I'll leave it up to you to, to throw the confetti. Well, well just, uh, just before, um, I just wanted to read 
um, Laura's comment, Laura Ferrer's comment to Everett. Um, thank you for sharing so openly, Everett. Um, and I saw there were a couple of people that had their hands up um, and then maybe put them down. Um, and so I'm seeing uh, one, Francisco, I believe you had your hand up earlier and then it went back down. So I don't know if you wanted to maybe unmute sure. yourself. I also saw KT and right now I'm seeing Elizabeth. So, you know, maybe we can have like so, a pop. Let me see. Francisco, hi. Yeah. Hi. So, hi everybody. So nice to be here with all of you. I don't really have a question other than just an observation about um, Peter's resonance in my life, having been someone who, you know, I've worked with incarcerated people for many years, but also come from circumstances in which I was kind of born in a war, came to, came to personhood in a war, and the resonance of a black man of happiness or that kind of happiness that we search for is so important because if you're going to be in the struggle, if you're committed to struggles and to your life and to your community for a lifetime, it's much more than being reacting to oppressions. We are not marionettes and puppets whose lives are consumed by just saying, ouch. Oh, ah. we are so much more than that. And we have to become the stewards of life, the keepers of joy, the keepers of humanity. So my joy is satisfaction. I don't put too much stock in this idea of bliss is your birthright and we all so No, my bliss is satisfaction of peace, of justice, of dignity. And I always ask people whom I work with who have been through trauma and difficult times, what do you want to be when you are free? You know, it's very much resonates what you said earlier, Peter, and your work is of so much interest and, and help for me because as an artist, I also want to say that our struggles are approached from many angles, from the angle of the power I feel from growing my garden, how do I bring it into this boardroom? How do I bring in my colors into dealing with the nitty gritties of homelessness? How do I do that? How do we empower ourselves as artists with vision and words to be respected in, in communities that are really arriving at solutions? And so that's the other thing about your work, Peter, is that it empowers artists. It empowers unspoken. It empowers people who live at home and find quiet joys of just being a father or being a mother. Uh, the, the simplicity of our joy is much more than just what makes us unhappy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just, mm -hmm. and because we feel guilt for saying, yes, I'm in the struggle and I feel happy, as if somehow we need to be filled with rage and indignity in order to be effective. But our efficacy is helped by following these trails you're, you're making for us, Peter, mm. that we as human beings need to find our joy, need to identify those who have stood in joy or in more plentiful humanity. Mm -hmm. So no question, just a mm -hmm. and thank you. So nice to be here with all of Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, Ricardo? You going to let other folks say something? Or yeah, I, I saw I saw Elizabeth had her hand raised, mm -hmm. so I was just going to, um, if you wanted to mm -hmm. comment, Elizabeth. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Peter, for your generosity. Your your in sharing your wisdom. If what is the stake uh, right now for us in this conjuncture that we are living is the peaceful future of our next generations. Where do we draw as artists and poets and writers to communicate this search for the ending of happiness to our fellow citizens in a country that's being crushed with our hopes are being crushed and, and, and a, a, an entire generation of 
African American women and men are being dehumanized, as you say before, on the streets of America. Where do we draw from as artists to communicate this happiness? Mm -hmm. uh, I can jump in. Are there other thoughts from other people before we close it? I can close it with responses to what uh, Elizabeth is saying, or I can hear whatever else anybody else wants to say. I won't forget it. Ricardo, you guiding? Yeah, I was going to say, um, I, I think, um, I have, don't remember if there was anyone else that had their hand okay. up. Okay. But, um, yeah, cool. So, um, I can oh. jump in if, um, I, if that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's KT here. Oh, shoot. I have my little blinder on. Okay. <laughs> Hi. I just want to jump in and um, I'm so excited to hear this conversation, Peter. I didn't know that happiness was going to be your topic uh, when we started. And um, it's something that I studied for quite a while. And I put it in the um, chat there. There's actually, it's such a huge area of scholarly and scientific devotion. And I put the Greater Good Science Center in there. They um, study happiness. And it's this topic that goes back for thousands and thousands of years, right? Trying to um, understand what is happiness, you know, and uh, the Greeks thought it was something that comes at the end of life, right? At the end of a good and noble life in the pursuit of, um, of helping one another. And that's very much like a Confucian too, something that brings the good in others to completion uh, versus Hinduism, you know, that is uh, the more freedom from desire, et cetera. But I just, I, I had a question because um, back to that Greater Good Science Center, um, all the studies that they've come up with, they come up with this happiness pie, if you will that says half of our happiness or 50% of our happiness is a set point that just like our personalities, each and every one of us has 50% of us or our happiness if we're a really quote unquote happy person, right? That yes, events may change that for a little while, but then we'll return back to our set point or if something really devastates us, you know, it'll devastate us for a while, but then we'll come back to our set point. Um, what I liked was, uh, well, what I'm curious about is they say that 10% of happiness is circumstantial. So that would be back to um, the struggle, right, for BIPOC, for minority communities, for anybody who's been otherized. And then there's this 40% piece that they say that comes from your intentionality. And I struggle with this because it's part of what I hear you saying, right? Especially to our young gentleman who says, you know, that uh, nobody, you know, he doesn't know anybody else who's happy. So part of that feels like the Greek version, right? It's the happiness that you achieve at the end of life, knowing that you had a life well lived with purpose and intentionality. And then the other part of me wants to throw that out the window and it's like a lot of positive psychology. Oh, if I only just believe, you know, it kind of is pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yet I can't discount this because it's a science, right? They're studying this. So I just kind of wondered if you wanted to respond to any, I know that was a lot. I just, you got me so excited, <laughs> so excited on this topic. So I just wonder where the struggle fits in, how you see that, you know, working. Um, I, my late aunt Mahalia, uh, well actually her name was Mahaley, but uh, she used to, uh, we used to call her Ma Aunt Haley. She used to always tell us she lives in a rural town called Powhatan in Virginia. And she used to always tell us, you always have a place to lay your head in, my, in our house. She was married to my brother, my, my uncle, my, uh, my uncle Kissel, we called him. I start with that because she's from Virginia, which is where, of course, Thomas Jefferson uh, lived. Um, and I want to make sure I zero in on, on Haley and and, and the, the elders who were imprinting me without me even knowing it. They were imprinting me with the sense that um, it's everything is everything. So as I do read my share of the science of happiness, the positive psychology books. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're interviewing any black people. Frankly, I, when I read the books, I don't see any mention 
of cultural uh, variances, such as, well, we, we interviewed 40 black men to talk about the same, and ask them the same questions uh, that we asked this other uh, test group or whatever. And this is connected to what Elizabeth was saying. Um, and I think I can link it a little bit to what my friend and teacher uh, uh, Francisco was saying. So where do I look for inspiration and happiness? Well, as I said to Jenny, I certainly do not discount myself. I have all, if I have control, quote unquote, over anything, it's of how I think. So I understand as I read about positive psychology that if we smile, the brain doesn't know whether we're smiling for someone or in a certain situation. It does its number from the perspective of a chemical dump. And so it behooves us to smile as often as we can. But in and of itself, that's not going to stop a bullet from blowing your brain out. Or it's not going to inspire you to fight against rogue cops. Or it's not going to it's not going to provide you with any more insights into how you analyze society's configuration so that billions of dollars are gone are being are being basically pumped out of the working and human uh, economy into uh, rich white boys uh, pockets. So in and of itself, knowing that I can smile and improve my brain chemistry. It, is not going to save society. So that's why I say this is not an either or anything. I happen to have a set point that's pretty fucking like remarkable to me. I don't even know how I had it. It is truly nature. Because I've been through some serious shit in my life, as some of the bio uh, that Jamie introduced me with will attest to. And somewhere inside of me is the same impulse to make beauty that the men and women who first began to hum spirituals in the middle of a cotton field under lock and key and while people were had had weapons pointing at them there's something inside of me as a unique individual that does have a set point of sort of humane inspirational uh keep you know energy where I'm not going to, and plus politically speaking, this is why I said in my open remarks, I'm not here to make somebody else happy and then die. That may be why the capitalists who are brought, who in Africa and elsewhere, who led to the enslavement of, of millions of people, that may be what their thinking was, but it's not my thinking as an heir to that legacy. And as an heir to the legacy of the Maroons who fought and created community in swamps, uh, who tried to go back home by uh, taking over the Amistad. So believe me, uh, I mean, I learned about the Chilean struggle, uh, uh, Francisco, if he's still here with us, I learned about it reading in the Black Scholar uh, magazine back in the 70s. That's where I learned about uh, the, the uh, what is it, Operation Condor, I think you've been teaching me about that. That's where I learned about Victor Hara and the powerful uh, use of folk art in resistance. Um, so, you know, Elizabeth, while we're talking, you know, I look to my Aunt Haley, who is dead now, and who never really lived any kind of public life, but who always welcomed me and my father and my brothers and sisters and my mother to this little house on a corner, <laughs> you know, down the street from this church that was always hot. I looked to her and I looked to her as an individual and I looked to her as a symbol because freedom to me is at very core conceptual freedom. So, I'm not letting anybody in this brain um, in a way that somehow stunts me or somehow tells me I'm not valuable and I don't have a right to my everything from my imagination to my critical political analysis. So 
One, as we close out, happy, happiness, not happy, go lucky. Catalyst, enzyme. What can thinking about joy catalyze you to do? In my case, in LA, for example, it's helped me build the world stage. I was a, in 1989, they started in 1991, I joined the Anansi Writers Workshop. I'm not there as often as I used to be. I certainly wasn't as gray then as I am now, but I contributed to that circle with critique, with open spirited, uh, with curiosity. So I believe that as a catalyst happiness says, Peter, get involved in that circle, however it makes sense to you. As an enzyme, I look at the same stuff everybody looks at, the viral videos of, of our uh, fellow citizens, our fellow human beings getting crushed, shot, um, people making videos of them, of their deaths. I look at all that as much as I can, but as an enzyme, happiness allows me to say, that is the truth, and so is the resistance and the fight we're doing to get Miss Taylor justice and her family. We cannot bring dead people back, but we can work for a life or the lives of all of us. And that's what happiness, or at least my quest for it and my claiming of it, that's what helps me uh, personally to be not an optimistic person, but a deeply hopeful person who is dedicated to collaborating with as many folks who are about something serious and ethical and game-changing as I can connect with. I hope that contributes. Thank you so much. This has been a truly a remarkable conversation. Um, I just wanna say a few words about um, our funding program. We are funding virtual literary events um, in California. And I just want to make sure that you all know that in case I know you're all writers or literary presenters. Um, I want to encourage you to look to Poets and Writers Readings and Workshops program uh, for support of readings and creative writing workshops in your communities. Um, we fund the writers who do that work and if you have any questions about that program, you can feel free to contact me directly. Um, we're always here to answer your questions. Um, and then last but not least, I don't wanna keep you too much longer. I just wanna thank uh, Peter J. Harris for speaking so honestly um, to everyone and also to thank you all um, for being here, for joining us um, and for your contributions. And um, I wish you all the best, um, stay safe, and I hope to see you at our next town hall, which will be announced in, in the next couple of weeks. Okay, have a great evening, and um, if you'd all like to unmute and just clap, oh, we can, we can finish it like that. Thank you Yay. all. My pleasure to participate. Thank you so much, thank everybody. Thank you so much.